Okay, good evening and welcome to Joslin Art Museum's More for Members program. Thank you for joining us tonight and thank you so much for being a member and a donor of the museum. Um, I am Agni Dezona, Foundation Giving and Major Donor Manager at Joslin. And I am pleased to welcome tonight our Associate Curator of Native American Art, Annika Johnson, and the artist uh, from her studio in Portland, Oregon, Wendy Red Star. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. Everyone is muted. Um, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A function on your screen. Just type in the question and we will have some time to answer the questions at the end of the presentation. If uh, we don't get your question, but you come up with something you want to ask us, please don't hesitate to email us at giving at joslin.org. If you have any technical difficulties, please use the chat function and we will try to help you with that. And again, thank you for joining us tonight. And you, I hope you will enjoy the presentation and Annika, take it away. Hello, welcome everyone and welcome Wendy. Thank you so much for joining us from your studio and sharing a little bit about the exhibition that's coming up. Um, I'm very excited about it. I think everybody will enjoy this conversation. Um, I would first like to acknowledge I'm here in Omaha. I think a lot of people are zooming in from Omaha and we are on the homelands of the Omaha tribe. So at Joslyn, we like to pay respects to their elders past, present and future. Uh, before we dive into our conversation, I'm going to share with you a little bit about Wendy. Wendy said to keep it short, which is really difficult, so I'll try. Um, Wendy is an artist and a scholar. Um, her art and curatorial work build upon years of her research in archives and museum collections of historical Crow art um, that are located across the country. So she's worked at the Smithsonian um, and archives all over. <laughs> um, she works in a wide range of media, so photography, sculpture, video, fiber arts, and oftentimes creates these very immersive installations that incorporate historical photographic imagery into them. She was raised on the Apsalaga or Crow Indian Reservation in Montana. She holds a BFA from Montana State University at Bozeman and an MFA in sculpture from UCLA. Her work is in collections across the country, um, and I'd like to share with you a series of her. It's a four part photographic series and we have a, a copy here at Joslyn and this was a really formative work for me in my own thinking about curatorial work, about Native American art history, about contemporary art, um, and it's, a, it's called The Four Seasons. And there are four photographs that really explore the history of representation of Native American people, as well as the role, at least I think as a curator, the role that the museums play in the display of, of Native American history and culture. Um, so they have these sort of kitschy backgrounds and inflatable animals, and yet Wendy has this very um, deadpan, if not self-defiant pose. So Wendy, I just wanted to say this, this series has been foundational to my thinking. Um, Okay, this is the most I'll talk. I'm just going to share a little bit more about the context of our conversation. Um, you're in for a treat today because Wendy's going to share a little bit about her research process and the archives she's worked in for an upcoming exhibition in our Riley Contemporary Artist Project Gallery. Um, so the show opens the end of this January, so she's in the middle of preparing work for this and has indeed been working on it for quite a few months. Um, so this engages a history that's very specific to Omaha. Um, it engages the history of the 1898 Indian Congress. And this was an unprecedented convening of over 30 Native American tribes during Nebraska's Trans-Mississippi Exposition. And this included a number of Crow individuals who traveled to Omaha from Montana. And a Nebraskan named Frank Reinhardt was contracted to be the exposition photographer. So this is really a world's fair. Um, and he photographed the, the encampments in what is now North Omaha, as well as several of the, the delegation members who traveled here from around the country. Um, I have some of those photos on the screen. You'll learn more about these. 
Um, so to prepare for this exhibition, Wendy traveled here in December. We had an awesome time. She explored Omaha, um, a lot of the sites that relate to this history. So she's going to talk more about this research trip. And to start, I'm so curious to learn what drew you to this history in the first place. So Wendy, <laughs> take it away. Uh, thank you, Annika. Um, you say Apsalaga really well. I'm super impressed by that. And um, thank you to the Jocelyn Museum for sticking through. This has been a long time coming. I um, first visited the Jocelyn, I believe, in 2016 when I was doing a residency at the Bemis Art Center. Um, and that first experience, I also got to look at some of the Native American objects in the collection. And there are a few crow objects and uh, immediately made a connection with the head curator there, Toby, um, and uh, secured a, an opportunity to exhibit a solo show there. Um, and so while I was thinking about what I would do for a solo exhibition, I have, um, I always try to root myself in ways that I can connect myself to that area. And for Omaha, I'm actually, my um, mother's side of the family, she is Irish, of uh, Irish descent. All of her family um, is from Nebraska area. So I already had some connection there to Omaha. So I was very excited about that. And then uh, when I started um, digging a little bit deeper, I then uh, linked Reinhardt and his images of the Indian Congress um, and dug into that. And I was very um, just in, in awe of sort of the magnitude of 500 individual Native people gathering together. And uh, the images of Reinhardt um, are so beautiful and um, the other thing that I really appreciate about those images is that he has written each individual sitter's name and their tribal affiliation which is a uh, which is which is rare and sometimes hard to do so that was even more exciting for me because then that gives me um, a sort of a, a nice jumping off platform to then like look into each of these individuals um, and then fast forward, <laughs> the um, An Annika came on board and um, we have sort of then solidified this idea of really focusing on the Indian Congress and sort of bringing that history to life. And then we decided we would um, bring me back again to Omaha to do a research trip that specifically focused on Reinhardt and these photographs. So there's an image of the park. Annika was so great. She did a whole little tour there and Annika's all actually new to Omaha as well. <laughs> so I sort of, she sort of did a lot of groundwork and we actually ended up going to this park. What, what is the name of this park again? Is it? This is Kuntz Park in North Omaha. No, North Omaha and it's pretty much um, the only place really that kind of still has information about the Trans-Mississippi International Exposition. Um, so it was really wonderful to come in contact with these plaques and uh, see some of the images and history and actually just kind of stand there. I really wanted to feel, really what I'm trying to get to is really kind of feeling and rooting myself within that uh, piece of history. And so to stand on the actual land was really amazing as well. And then we looked uh, for Reinhardt. <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually, uh, it's stated and actually in this book, if you look in the little window here that I have here, um, which is called The Face of Courage, the Reinhardt Collection of Indian Photographs by Royal Sutton. Um, it states that this is the only known image of Reinhardt. There's maybe one other image um, and so it's actually him dressed up uh, as um, Napoleon <laughs> for a masquerade 
So if there's only one image, it's got to be this image because it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always love to like know who is behind that camera because you see these powerful uh, subjects and sitters, but who were they staring back at? And to think that they were staring back at this guy who took a lot of time, you know, making that extra curl in his hair <laughs> um, is, is really interesting to me. But um, he, he did a phenomenal job. So I am indebted to him for uh, creating such an amazing historical catalog. And it wasn't just him, it was also Murr. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, Adolf Murr. And he worked with um, Edward Curtis to like a, a decade after he did this work with Reinhardt, which, you know, and looking at these photographs, we can get into this too. <laughs> but Reinhardt's photos are very different from Edward Curtis's photos. And I think, you know, a lot of people tuning in today are probably more familiar with Curtis's. Um, but it is interesting that there's that through line. Um, yes. He was working on both projects. Okay. And I find that actually quite a bit when I'm, especially with photos of my community, a lot of these photographers kind of um, interconnect in interesting ways. So, but definitely Edward Curtis came and photographed the Upsalaga too in the early 1900s um, after Reinhardt had been there. So yeah, so then I was like, let's try to find Reinhardt's grave. So then we went on this interesting adventure uh, to Forest Lawn Cemetery which I highly recommend uh, if you want to get out of your house, uh, do a little uh, debrief uh, from your quarantine to wearing your mask <laughs> at Forest Lawn Cemetery. Um, this was amazing. I don't know, uh, Annika has a, like a real gift of investigator mode and we were actually able to get a key to go into this chapel and actually then find where he is buried with his daughters, I believe, at least his daughters and his yeah. wife. Family members, yeah. We were Maybe not his wife. Family, let's just say family members. Family members. I feel yeah. like I'm putting some misinformation out there. I'm building a narrative that <laughs> might be more of my own. But anyway, so it was really wonderful to actually see his name and see, see where he is. Mm-hmm. And then um, this was all pretty much in the same day. So we just kind of this whirlwind. Um, and uh, later on in that day, we ended up where uh, Reinhardt's photography studio is. And can you explain where this is in Omaha? Yeah, so this is downtown, the Brandeis building. Um, I believe there's like a subway <laughs> on the ground floor now, and I'm forgetting exactly which street it's on. I, I forget if it's Farnham, but it's at the intersection of 16th and something. It's right downtown um, and it's apartments now. And we, we tried to get into the building. We found some reference to a studio being on the seventh floor and it used to be a department store back in the day. And, you know, he photographed the Indian Congress and then had this studio for a couple of decades afterwards. Um, so we couldn't see the actual studio, but we tried. Yeah, and then his uh, photography studio actually got um, taken over by another photographer who, Marston, is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he actually really helped to kind of preserve these glass negatives, make um, prints from them, and printed them in uh, a few uh, photo collections, a few books that were then gifted to different uh, archives. So that was really important um, as well, mm -hmm. the care of those um, images. So, um, and then besides that, we, um, another part of this trip was going to, um, to the archives. Um, and Annika took me to the Omaha Public Library, and which was really wonderful to work with all the staff there. And um, they give us access to some of the physical prints um, and just, just to get to handle those prints and um, take a closer look. We were starting to notice um, different things about the sitters, uh, some of them maybe wearing the same blanket or holding 
the same objects, sometimes wearing the same clothes. So that was another interesting thing as well. This is actually White Swan. He's um, a member of the Upsalaga Nation and he was a scout for Custer and ended up getting shot and wounded his hand. I think you can actually see the hand that is uh, holding that weapon is um, disformed or disfigured a little bit. And he was actually deaf too. So he's a uh, deaf here um, at the Indian Congress. And the other thing that's really noted about White Swan is that he is known as the first Upsalaga artist. I don't know about that. I coined by whatever white man said he was. Um, but I actually really have an affinity, affinity to that being an artist myself. Um, and he made, he made these amazing ledger drawings. A lot of these ledger drawings are in different collections. For instance, at the Denver Art Museum, I know they have a white swan um, yeah. ledger drawing as well. Mm -hmm. And here's an example of um, two different men. They kind of look similar in here. <laughs> um, oh, the guy on the left side is a Cheyenne guy. And the guy on the right side is uh, Upshaw. Why am I blanking on his oh, first name? Alexander. Thank you. Alexander Upshaw. Alexander Upshaw. Um, and he was Upsalaga. And there's a very interesting story about these two men because they actually both uh, left their reservations to attend Carlisle Indian boarding school. Um, and then uh, Upshaw, he, after he finished and uh, graduated from Carlisle Indian school in Pennsylvania, he ended up um, teaching for a couple years in Genoa. Is it Genoa? Uh, Genoa. Mm -hmm. Genoa, thank you. Um, in Nebraska and was contacted there um, to be an interpreter for the Crow delegation that went to uh, the Indian Congress. So that was really fascinating. And that was the same why, the same reason why this Cheyenne man, I wish I knew his name. I think his name got cut off in the slide. But he was also an, an interpreter as well for the Cheyenne delegation. And I think he ended up being in some Hollywood films later. <laughs> so he went on to kind of be a movie star. And Upshaw actually then returned to the Crow Reservation and was the main interpreter for Edward Curtis when Edward Curtis came to photograph the Upsala guest. So this really interesting interconnections. But they happened to be wearing the same floral uh, style, floral beaded style scout jacket which was uh, popular around that time, um, modeled after European jackets. Um, and Annika and I were actually able to find a really fascinating article about the reason why these two men ended up in the same outfit and sort of their, uh, thought, their thoughts and opinions on that as well. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that one? Well, I... I think it's really interesting going through these photographs with you and you kind of filling in the biographical information about these, the sitters, because in the literature on Indian Congress so far really focuses on the sort of ethnographic impetus for the, for the fair. It was organized by James Mooney, who was a Smithsonian ethnologist who sent out this circular to different Indian agents across the country saying, help me, you know, figure out how to get people here from as many tribes as possible. And the goal was to educate people about different types of housing and different types of indigenous arts and um, which was very common for World's Fairs at the time. But really, when you look at people like uh, White Swan and then Alexander Upshaw, these were really well-known people. I mean, movie stars too. Yeah. These were yeah. people who were traveling, who were teaching. A lot of them had gone to school on the East Coast. A lot of them had been part of, you know, the Indian Wars of the 19th century and were really recognizable names nationally. Absolutely. And yeah. Um, Geronimo and uh, Red Cloud, am I saying that one right? I'm blanking mm -hmm. on his name. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to make any Lakota mad. Um, 
this happens to be the Upsalaga delegation and there's over uh, 20 members. And I love the fact that there's women and children included um, as well. And this is actually missing some of um, the delegation members as well. So uh, after that research trip, then I had a lot to think about <laughs> and actually got so excited that I, we sort of figured out what we wanted um, what direction we wanted to go and how I wanted to convey uh, the power of such a large gathering. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, so the process um, in the exhibition concept was to print as many of the Indian Congress members as possible. And then I would then uh, cut each of these uh, members out and so here's my stack. Um, and here's a little bit of the, <laughs> some of the members. Wendy, I have a question for you. In, okay. So you have spent probably more time with these photographs than anybody. <laughs> and even when you're the process of cutting them out, you're really getting to know who these people are. I mean, you're seeing what they're wearing, seeing some of the, um, correlations to what other individuals are wearing and there's also multiple views of a lot of people there are like yeah. these file views busts and then full-length portraits um, what are some of the other things that you you have learned about these individuals and also Reinhardt's photographic practice in spending this incredible amount of time with like it's 600 photographs I forget the exact number but it's quite a few um, you know, it, I, yeah, like you said, it's like a very intimate process where I'm getting to pick up sort of different details. And I'm, what I'm really loving is I'm very familiar with Salaga and some of the clothing that they're wearing and some of what that represents. But then to have the opportunity to then um, uh, cut some of the, like the Omaha Nation, some of their tribal members and uh, look at how they're sort of representing themselves as well is some of the diversity with, with among these uh, communities and these nations um, is what I'm really kind of picking up on mm -hmm. and very sensitive to that matter as well. And like you said, me like knowing about Alexander and him going to uh, Carlisle and being an interpreter for uh, Edward Curtis all of these people have a story and a very powerful story, not just a powerful story, but an important story to the fabric of American history. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the gravity and the weight of which I'm feeling while I'm, you know, cutting these images out. And so I really feel like this process is important um, for uh, Jocelyn and a great opportunity for Jocelyn Museum to really connect with these different uh, native nations. Um, because this is just my slice of the pie that I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. and it's, um, there's so much to it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you said that because it's really fantastic that this collection is here in Omaha at the Public Library and that while well, COVID, it's not open now, but normally it is open to the public and you can come in and see these amazing photographs and they're all online and there's high res images online. But a lot of people um, who are at the Congress are from this area. There are a lot of Omaha and Ponca and Lakota people here and who participated in this event too. And I imagine had um, a role as hosts. Um, so I, I think there are all of these different tendrils of research that can come out of this project. And even when you just, when you were here and we were at the Omaha Public Library, we came up with a list of like a hundred questions. Like, why are they wearing this? Why are they posed that way? Why was this background chosen? What were they talking about when everybody was in this huge camp? You know, what was the, the um, situation of the camp like? You know, why did people travel for this? There's just, there are so many avenues of, of research, which maybe segues to another question I have for you is how the Indian Congress intersects with research that you've done and where it's sort of taken you, um, especially as it relates to your research in Montana and just your experiences growing up on the, the Crow Reservation. 
what I'm finding the the more and more that I um, sort of dive into uh, historical research, the more that it's just a, a all interconnected. <laughs> and there's a connection here and there. And that, I think that's what's highly addictive to this process is um, sort of like, it's like I'm, a, I'm weaving, weaving together all these strands that are sort of um, dislocated and then putting them together. It's like a giant puzzle. And so this is just part of that puzzle. Um, and it's bled into and intersected with uh, several other projects that I've been working, like the 1880 Crow Peace delegation. Um, a group of uh, tribal members went to Washington, D.C., but they also then visited the Carlisle Indian School a year after it opened and gave the okay so that, you know, Upshaw would go there. So mm -hmm. all of these things are, are so um, interconnected. And um, yeah, it's like I wish I <laughs> had more time and could know more, but I really feel like this is my life's purpose. Uh, so these images are actually uh, some of the different displays uh, at the exposition. Um, we've got Idaho here and Douglas County, Nebraska. And I really like these displays, the displays of the different fruits or, or things that um, each county was highlighting. Mm -hmm. And so for me in thinking of creating an, an, an experience would be to model um, these displays um, like they are at the actual original Congress and then include my cutouts on these shelves with their um, various tribal groups and also their names so that um, in the exhibition space there'd be these shelvings that then uh, the viewer could walk into and sort of not sort of but be totally immersed within the Indian Congress and have an opportunity to sort of fill that immense gathering that I just maybe a tiny little bit of what that might have felt like, but also um, really kind of highlighting these individuals. Mm -hmm. Okay, for the sake of time. Yes, we're um, running out of time. We could go on and on and on, but I definitely want to get to these incredible images that you have of Montana and just to hear you talk more about um, Reinhardt's photographs in Montana okay. and how you're relating to these because for listeners, yeah. um, I think it was seven years later, seven or eight years later, Reinhardt went to the Crow Reservation to Pryor, which is where you grew up, correct, Wendy? It was actually pretty soon after. Um, Okay. Yeah, so it was probably early 1900. So uh, probably like 1900 because uh, Edward Curtis came to the reservation around 1907. Um, so yeah, so it was pretty soon after. So he must have made a great connection with um, the Upsaliga delegation. He must have found our jokes incredibly funny. It was like, I must go to Upsaliga country. <laughs> Anyway, so there's a picture of my father, and he's pointing to this exact area, um, which is on a reservation near a sacred site called Bapwa, which translates to um, like prayer rock or where they hit arrows into. Um, so go ahead and you can go to the historical images. Um, and so here's a, an encampment, and this is actually a popular spot, a gathering spot in the summer that a, the Upsalaga would gather um, and then prepare for like a big hunt to last them or help last them through the winter season. And I actually grew up just like a couple miles on the other side of this mountain. Um, so I know this spot really well and have had many experiences there. So it was really amazing to then have that connection to have Reinhardt then, you know, not only in Omaha, but then to have that direct connection on my reservation. You can go to the next one. And here's a group of powerful women. I'm sure they made fun of Reinhardt a lot. <laughs> you probably didn't know. <laughs> and here's a, just a video panorama of the actual area. Give you a better idea here. Um, and these uh, mountain for these form rock formations on the top are, we call them um, medicine rocks and they're, um, 
places where uh, different Upsalaga men have fasted up there to receive visions. It's just a very powerful and important um, area on our reservation. And then the last photo is just my daughter. <laughs> Juxtaposed with an image of bird all over the ground, um, or as we call his descendants today, birding ground, um, near uh, the Castle Rocks or Medicine Rocks as well. So I just really love this, you know, continuing, uh, you know, history evolving, and um, that my daughter is that next continuation who's experienced that spot as well. Mm -hmm. I love seeing these photographs juxtaposed or, you know, more so a continuation, like you said. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what you, your, reflex, your reflections in looking at these historical photographs, how they inform your photographic practice. And I wish I had included a slide of this, but the Absalaga Feminist series, um, especially when you, you know, we had this image, let me go back to it of the women on horseback, which is a really powerful image. Um, how, how, does, how do these photographs and then your work in general as an archivist, as a researcher, as an artist fit within this broader practice of absalaga feminism for you? You know, the, doing the research really grounds me, especially, um, you know, being immersed in the culture and participating in the culture, but um, nor it's so normal to me that uh, often, and a lot of Upsalaga uh, tribal members have the same experience where that's just what it is, how it is. And so there's not really questioning, why do I, why do I have these elk teeth on my dress? Or why does my, you know, horse, when we parade it, why does my, you know, dad tie a rope around its neck? Well, because that symbolized, you know, a good horse that was stolen from another enemy camp, you know, but maybe they, he doesn't even know why he does it, but it's just something that we do. And so to me, it really sort of grounds me. Um, and it also provides me so much hope to realize that there, there is that continuation that it's the culture is still um, moving forward and we're still maintaining it and holding it. Um, and so that's why, uh, for me, it's so important to educate myself and mm -hmm. create these sort of timelines, piece these histories together so that the future of Saliga feminists can <laughs> then like have this sort of tapestry that's already woven together that they can continue to, to add to it as well. And not only just for me and of Saliga, um, for everyone, because this is the fabric of this country as well and, and the history of this country. So um, I think that's why they go hand in hand. Um, one informs the other and it, it's just a continuation. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you. I'm gonna take down this PowerPoint and open it up to questions if we, have any questions? I'm going to pull up the Q&A. None yet. If you guys have questions, type them into the Q&A. Um, I'm going to take a look and can ask Wendy. Um, you know, I, I have my eye on this right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fantastic because your work, for me as an art historian, I'm not really like a creator or a maker. It's much easier for me to grasp what's going on historically through work like yours. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's something to be said when you unite the Congress in this space and sort of recreate this commercial space. So there are tensions between the, the photographs of the individuals in this actual setting. Um, you do have to have a lot of contextual understanding, I think, when you go in there, but you'll still experience, and I say you will because it's going <laughs> to open in January. I wish we were all there right now. Um, but you will still have this very powerful experience, and there's something about that that just for me as a historian, I, I find incredibly um, intriguing and important and um, just a, a much, maybe it's the way I learn, but it's just a much better way to kind of comprehend the history and get the scope of it. 
here are some questions. I appreciate that. And I wish I, uh, I never liked history when I was going to school, but now I'm obsessed with it. And I wish I had a history teacher like myself. I think I'm just like a glorified history teacher. <laughs> <You know? laughs> awesome. <laughs> we do have a few questions coming in. Okay. So somebody says they love your, this is Barbara Robbins. Oh, hi, Barbara. Love your historical research and visual project and the photos of home. Um, she grew up in Glendive. Montana. Oh, cool. Um, Trisha Hollins, when does the exhibition begin? So it opens at the very end of January. Um, and we hope to see you all there. Because of COVID, we aren't going to be able to do a lot of events. And this is a smaller exhibition space. It's a 400 square foot space, which is perfect for this sort of immersive installation. Um, but yes, um, it will open then. OK, so from P Peter. Peter Fankhauser. Hi, Peter. Uh, do you think there could be another Indian Congress to advocate for sovereignty and improvement of the conditions of our indigenous nations? I, yeah, when I think about that, because um, you got to understand the motivations. And I think, Annika, you were sort of um, getting to that, like the, the context. And so the context for the exposition was to make money, to um, stimulate the economy there in Omaha. And the Indian Congress was sort of added into it because they knew they could make money off of um, sort of the, the curiosity of white settlers um, mm -hmm. and uh, Native people. Mm -hmm. And, um, but one of the things that they weren't expecting <laughs> was the experience of the Native person and these different tribal nations getting together you know, some, some of our most uh, uh, people who uh, were our great enemies, you know, were there as Upsalaga people, but yet this was like a neutral territory where we could sort of say like, hey, what's going on with you? Like, what has the U.S. government done to you? Or what's your Indian agent like? <laughs> or things like that. And so that wasn't something that they were even thinking about, the creators of... Um, the exposition that Native people would get together and speak and, um, you know, make connections themselves. And so I think that was like very vital and important for us. And um, I think, yeah, it would be amazing to resurrect that experience again. Um, that would be so powerful if that mm -hmm. could happen. I think it could totally could happen. But yeah, I think uh, bringing this, like this history, up um, to the light so people know about it, I think is one way to kind of start these conversations. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought too, there, there have to be um, family histories, oral histories, various accounts from the perspectives of those who attended the Indian Congress um, that maybe illuminate some of those histories that weren't recorded, because I mean, for what you and I could find published were like, it's academic papers and then the official government reports and then newspaper articles. So yeah, I would be interested to find, and this would be an extremely difficult project to track down <laughs> all of this sort of research, but I feel like in a way you're doing it just by going to, you know, the homelands of the delegation members and just through your understanding of, of Salaga culture, you can, not fill in the gaps, but really broaden and flesh out our understanding of this historical moment. And it, it seems to take a kind of research that isn't, that goes far beyond the archive, you know, yes. it's, it's both of those things. Um, oh, okay, we have a question from Mary. Can you recommend a book about Native Americans for a fifth grade girl learning American history? She is watching with me today. Um, Annika? I think that's a great question for you. <laughs> I, you know, actually all of the books that I, um, I'm reading right now are all about the Upsalaga Nation. You know what I think would be good, and then, then I, I don't care, I want you to answer it, is actually, um, if you're from Omaha or wherever you're from, to read into the local uh, Native uh, nation that's there. Um, there's a lot of times 
certain anthropologists attached to each of these communities who have written books or maybe biographies of individuals from those communities. That's where I would start. Because mm -hmm. then you're like, you're, uh, or you're grounding yourself within the land that, that you're living on as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm trying to think of like really good fiction too. And I'm just, I can't think of anything, but I, I would say, and I know it's out there and I really hope people email um, the museum with recommendations. I know they'll come in, but yeah, I would say, you know, visit, visit tribal cultural institutions. I mean, go up at the Winnebago reservation is the angel decor museum. Um, and listen to indigenous people talk about their history and their culture, you know, and, and learn about the art, see things in person. Um, I think those are really important, um, things to do. And, you know, in terms of online resources, because I know we're all virtual right now, the National Museum of the American Indian has awesome, like very engaging sort of interactive online exhibits for, you know, kids of all different ages, but. That's actually a really good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Wendy, I could talk to you for a long time <laughs> and continue to talk. Um, Thank you everyone for coming. And again, like Agni said, if you have any more questions, you can email giving at joslyn.org. Um, they'll get forwarded to me. I can ask Wendy. Um, and I really hope that all of you come to see the exhibition when it opens. It's January 31st that it opens. Um, yeah, and at that point, come find me. We can have more conversations. Um, Thank you so much again, Wendy. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining. Again, email us at giving at joslyn.org. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Annika. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Bye.